All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, Entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I am one of the co-hosts here. I am here uh, with Andrew, the uh, super sleuth of the show. Uh, This episode is dropping in 2021, but as of this point in time, we are still uh, in 2020, so hopefully uh, we will make it out of 2020 when this episode releases, but... Anyways, how are you doing, man? I'm doing better than I deserve, dude, and I'm doing so good because I'm sitting also across from the absolute Drew. <laughs> We've got Drew in the studio with us today. How are you doing, Drew? I am doing well. I'm just honestly really excited, really honored to be here with you guys. I was really excited to be on with both of you. It's just really cool for me. Yeah, man. I figure I figure you've always kind of been here behind the scenes, and you're kind of here with us on our end of the year podcast, kind of hanging out with you and... Matthew Hunter, the uh, mm-hmm. husband of Joy, uh, the girl, yeah. uh, Tembi, or not Tembi, that's her, that's, that was her maiden name. Jerry. She's now, she's now no Joy longer. Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, we are here with, I feel silly because in the intro, I, I totally, I feel like I was like second guessing your name because for the longest time I thought it was Hannah, but it's actually Hannah. 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 <laughs> Hannah. 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 Castaneda. Hannah Castaneda. Castaneda. Yeah. Okay. I love it. I love it. Um. So, welcome. Thanks. You flew in from California. Yeah. So, uh, mm-hmm. glad uh, you got to escape from all the craziness. I mean, things are probably... Yeah. Well, you're Thank from God. the Bay Area, which is yeah. even... That place, from what I understand, it just... Everything's a complete lockdown. I was telling yeah. you that even the, the San Francisco 49ers, they're actually playing some of their home games here in Arizona because mm-hmm. everything is that draconian shut down. So, yeah, times <laughs> are strange, but all that aside... Uh, we are here today because we got in, we connected and we got in touch up probably a, it was probably a, mu- a couple months ago and you had talked about how you had grown up in the Unification Church, uh, aka the Moonies, and they mm-hmm. are uh, one of those cults. It's it's featured in Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults. Mm-hmm. It's something that he addressed during his time. Uh, it's a cult in the nineteen. When did it kind of come to fruition? Um, because this clip that we played uh, introducing this podcast, this is an interview from 1974, and you can tell it's like very old school. It's, it's not you wouldn't see an interview like this today. The interview guy has a cigarette in his hand, and it's just yeah. very old you know, camera, old school uh, interview. But um, but yeah, so you grew up in the Unification Church, mm-hmm. and um, you're here to talk to us about that. And so I think what would be good is um, maybe just tell them a little bit about yourself and. Maybe start explaining too, because I want to. I think people need to understand the context mm-hmm. of who Sun Young Moon was, kind of what the theology is, and in relation to they're kind of known for their mass marriages. It's mm-hmm. kind of like that. That's one thing that really defines them. Yep. Um, what it's like to have children, the aspect of having children, mm-hmm. those different aspects, what they believe about God, what they believe about Jesus, what they believe about salvation, because that sort of sets the foundation for really how you operated as someone who kind of grew up yeah. in the Moonies. So let's start with this. Uh, Reverend Sung Young Moon, Let's. how did it start? What What's the initial origin story of the Unification Church? Yeah, so Reverend Sung Young Moon, he was born, I believe it was in the 19, 1920, um, in North Korea. And um, he's self-proclaimed second, like he proclaims himself as the second coming, the second Messiah. Um, and... Yeah, the Moonies, they're known for their mass marriages. Um, one of the biggest things that they really focus on is um, the like the blood lineage. Mm. So their whole idea of like what the fall is is totally anti-Christian. Um, and we can maybe go into that, you know, into depth more. But um, the marriage is focused around um, creating a pure blood lineage. So Moon proclaimed himself as being sinless. And thereby having all these mass marriages um, from from those marriages would produce like sinless children. So my parents were the first generation that kind of joined. And I would say it really blew up in America, like around like the 70s, 80s. I'm not too good with dates, Mm -hmm. but um, and I was born 92. So I was I was considered second generation. They would call everyone who was born from these these mass marriages uh, were second generation um, they would call us blessed children. We were born without the original sin right. um, from the fall. So that basically, you know, is that we were uh, we're told that we were no longer part of Satan's lineage. We were pure, right? Mm. Um, that's kind of uh, 
I don't know if that if that clarifies some things of like how yeah. I was raised. So it's it was this weird dichotomy of like feeling very special, but then never really being good enough. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, very very works based. How, how did your parents get into it? Um, so my my dad's actually from Austria, and okay. my mother is American, um, and they were in an arranged marriage in New York. Um, so I don't know if you ever, if you research some of this stuff, but one of their biggest mass marriages was, I think, in 82 in Madison Square Garden in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're very big about um, cross-cultural, cross-cultural marriages um, and also like uniting all world religions, which we can definitely get into, too, because mm-hmm. <laughs> the Bible goes into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so one of the things, too, is so when you talk about the uh, mm-hmm. going back to like how things originated, mm-hmm. so... Uh, Sung Young Moon, he initially, like Walter Marr was kind of making a comparison in, in Kingdom of the Cults uh-huh. of him to Joseph Smith. Right. So apparently he had a point where he claims to have had sort of a private revelation or an yeah. encounter with Jesus. And this is sort of where he got... At age of, 16. At age yeah. 16. Mm-hmm. And this was where he realized that he was the second, he was sort of the, the Messiah of the Messiah. Well, he... So... Uh, what he claims is that when he was 16, so just uh, kind of backtrack, he grew up, um, his parents were actually, um, what was it? I think Dallas. Um, and they were like kind of poor farmers. He grew up that, and then they converted, I think 1930 to the Presbyterian church. Um, but he received some revelation at age 16 on a mountaintop on Easter Sunday, Jesus came down to him and basically was asking him to fulfill his mission. So, that's what their whole doctrine is based off of is that Jesus did not fi- fulfill his mission. He only um, mm-hmm. was able to bring salvation spiritually <laughs> and that um, Reverend Moon had to complete, complete his mission. Right. Well. Now, when you, now you say, uh, I'll, I'll jump, jump in here too in, in a second mm-hmm. too, Andrew, but um, so we want to make sure we define terms because a lot of times right. what cults will do is that they'll use language kind of the same way how Mormons will say how we need to return to our heavenly father. Right. right? And while, in many ways, you could sort of use that terminology to to explain Orthodox Christianity. They mm-hmm. mean fundamentally different things. So there's always a language barrier when it comes to the cults. So when they talk about Jesus' mission, uh, from a Christian right. perspective, from a biblical perspective, you're thinking about Jesus Christ coming to live a perfect life, to live the, to live the perfect life that we can never live, and right. to be the perfect sacrifice so we could have uh, our sin exchanged for his righteousness by faith in him. Mm-hmm. Like fundamental Orthodox Christianity. But what he taught, and you can explain this to right. us, is that it wasn't Jesus' purpose wasn't just to die for the sins of the world. It was to get married. Yes, Yeah, and that's where they take things out of context, especially when they say, like, um, when the Bible refers to the bride of Jesus, which is the church, but they take that literally as in Jesus was supposed to have a literal biological wife, Um, you know. And so um, they believe that Jesus was supposed to come and that his disciples were supposed to find him a bride. He was supposed to get married and have children and create a pure blood lineage. Mm. Um, but because of the lack of faith of his disciples or uh, whatever happened, that he had to go the way of the cross, that that was not God's intention. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, he, he wasn't able to fulfill his his mission. Thereby, you know, Moon saying, I need to fulfill the mission, have a family. Um, yeah, so... I want to I hinge back real quick to the, the vision account, too. So they do claim, like Hanna was saying, uh, on Easter morning, but actually, so they say it was April 17th, 1936 mm-hmm. was Easter morning. But if you actually just have a calculator, you can go back into calendars. Uh, Easter 17, 1936 was a Friday, not a Sunday. <laughs> let alone Easter Sunday. Right. You, yeah. Let alone Easter Sunday. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, so it's just not even it's like just just going into it is really interesting. But also the parallels between Joseph Smith. And moon That's is the thinking. fact that the first vision, they don't really actually even know the real date it happened. So there's arguments between them, right. between him being uh, the age 16 or the age 17. They've just given us a date now. Mm-hmm. Just like how we can see there's multiple first vision accounts with uh, Joseph yeah. Smith. They just kind of agree upon one, but they don't actually have solid historical fact. Uh, there are all these blurry facts that kind right. of shift over time depending on, you know, what's yeah. necessary. Mm-hmm. Right. So really, so, and so how, how does this affect you? Because we always talk about how, how theology affects people or bad theology hurts people. Um, so 
what how from your vantage point then is that your your parents would have been first generation. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually participated in one of these marriage ceremonies uh, with Sung Young Moon. And in fact, if you just look up Mooney's mass marriage on YouTube, you'll see tons of accounts for that. I think Vice has some documentaries, and it just, it's been featured a whole bunch of different times. But so their idea was that you would create. The second generation, they'd be known as the, you talk about this too, we know as the blessed children. Right. So mm -hmm. it means that your parents would have view you in a very unique way. Yes. Um, and you probably have a unique, unique view of yourself. I mean, kind of told that, you know, you probably, I'm assuming you probably grew up with friends that were not in your church. Right. And so it's like, how would you have the mindset as a child being that you're a blessed, you're one this blessed child specifically chosen because your parents were in this marriage by the second Messiah versus just your friend across the street. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, you know, from a young age, I always knew intuitively that something was pretty off about uh -huh. um, the church. I was always questioning everything. So when I was told that I was like born without original sin and that I was sort of just you know they they really exalted like oh the blessed children we would even like our parents would have to bow to us oh there was a lot gosh. of bowing and a lot of what? um yeah uh I guess Asian tradition um, because Moon's from Korea and even their you know their holy land um is is in Korea uh-huh um so being being kind of exalted and having this pressure put on you and saying like you are God's hope for the world, but then you look around, you look at your family, you look at other, they call them blessed families, right? Um, wow. And you're seeing how messed up and dysfunctional it is. It just didn't make sense. And that's what sinless looks like. <laughs> this is your idea of sinless, right. is, is all this dysfunction. It's like, you have to change the definition of what sin even is yeah. like, to try how, to yeah. function. How did that work, like, growing up in in church, how is there like counseling or anything like that? Like saying that there's, you know, issues going on in your life or even having to address sin issues. Like how do how do you think about your own thoughts in that sense when you're growing up? It's like, well, I'm supposed to be sinless, but I'm having these thoughts that I, I, I know are sinful. Right. You know, like how, how does counseling work in the unification church with uh, the blessed children? Um, I wouldn't even really say that there's uh, any proper counseling. Um, you know, I think that's why, unfortunately, um, so many people come out of cults and unification church with just so much mental health. Um, and that was me, too, you know, before I, I came to Christ or he came to me, you know. But, um, you know, you're the the really sad thing about it is that um, they would preach repentance and they would preach sin, but they never offered grace and forgiveness. And so you're in this constant cycle of like, OK. So I'm told that I'm, um, you know, I don't have this original sin, that I'm God's hope for the world, yet um, I'm thinking things I shouldn't think, and why am I so messed up, right? And then I'm just basically trying to chase my tail, and they, they talk about indemnity. So you have to, and paying indulgences, or you might have issues from, you know, some ancestor committed this sin. Mm. So um, you have to go restore and liberate your ancestors, and that's a whole other, th other thing. Um, so all this extra unnecessary guilt just out of kind of yeah. nowhere. Yeah. So you're just kind of like in this muck and mire of guilt and shame um, and just basically, you know, um, trying to compensate and make up for um, just where you fall short. Um, wow. So they do these things called, um, I would say, like indulgences or um, uh, just paying paying indemnity for uh, the sins that you paid rather than looking for Christ. That was, you know, everything was paid for on the cross um, you're, you're trying to, um, you know, just pay for those things yourself. So what takes place during those ceremonies? So people, your ancestors guilt upon you. What was that? You have your ancestors guilt kind of upon you that you have to help yeah, pay they call off it, as well. Yeah. They call it hereditary sin. So, um, wow. yeah. So in Korea, they, um, they have a place called Chungpyong and it's sort of like this, this marble city all dedicated to unification church members. And a lot of them like flock throughout the year um, you know, and, uh, it's all built upon really, uh, sort of ancestral veneration or ancestral, uh, worship. Um, so people go to these, they have these massive halls where you sit in rows, very organized rows, and you have these Korean leaders just kind of walking around and you have a stage of, of people, um, singing and dancing to a very, like, um, systematic beat and you're, you're hitting actually parts of your body to, 
liberate yourself of maybe evil spirits or mm. wow. yeah and um and then you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously. yeah and just um yeah so they 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 worship ancestors they you know talk to the dead um all those good things yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and then yeah so the, also what i was curious about me in your outline you had talked about so being someone who's second generation, yeah. you, are, you essentially because a lot of this has to do with lineage. Right. Um, you know, it's about, and also it's very generational focused. There's mm-hmm. a big family aspect, a generational aspect to it. But you had written down that second generation that you're viewed that you're viewed as pure and in God's lineage, and you were, and so your parents and first generation they were in Satan's lineage yeah. prior to Sun Young Moon. Prior to like the marriage ceremony. Yes. Yeah. And then, but. Even though you're you're viewed as a, you would be one of the people in second generation who's mm-hmm. viewed as a blessed child, but they would say you still have five percent responsibility. Yes, but God's a ninety five percent, and you have to do the five percent. Right. So, what does that five percent look like? That would include like getting matched and going to the this you know the holy marriage ceremony. Mm. Um, you know, uh, having having children. You know, if I had children, say if I was born or I was uh, married to another second generation um, and then had children, they would be like third generation. That's just kind of like advancing the kingdom in mm-hmm. their eyes um, and be reading all of um, Moon's speeches. Um, and they have different rituals and things they do. Like they have something called uh, Hundoke. Um, they use a lot of uh, Korean language. Um, so we would be reciting pledges, uh, in Korean at like 5 AM, a lot of bowing, um, different things like that. But I would say the biggest thing was around, uh, revolved around the, the holy marriage ceremony. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then going to, to Korea is a big thing as well. So, yeah. Tell them about the, the Korea aspect, because in many ways this is, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how much mm-hmm. people in the unification church can do that right now. Because of COVID, because literally everything is locked down. But typically, they would uh, see this almost as sort of like a holy pilgrimage. In many yeah. ways, in Islam, they would see that doing doing their their pilgrimage to Mecca right. is something that's very unique uh, for them. But just tell them just a little bit about that as well, too. Yeah. So, um, uh, going to Korea and to their you know their holy land that's I wouldn't that's not like a requirement, but it's definitely very it's encouraged. Um, especially if people are dealing with um, uh, certain sins um, that are unexplainable, they'll say, "Well, it's probably because of some ancestor, you know, did this this sin." Um, or some medium will tell them, um, "You know, you should go to go to Korea and um, you know do all these rituals and stuff like that." Um, that's that's sort of their their way of um, just. I guess, uh, what did I say? Just, yeah, I'm kind of blanking right now. <laughs> so I, I have a question. I'm just really, really curious. If as a second generation yeah. unification member, like a, the perfect child, you're sinless, why do you have 5% of your salvation left to earn if you're already sinless? So they be- they believe that second generation are um, born without the original sin. So they, they, they Oh, the, so you can still commit actual sins and then yeah, okay. yeah, you can still have all these other sins. And the original sin is based on the foundation that so what did you were you able to research anything about the fall? Like what their belief is or what the fall of Adam and Eve was? I did, and that was insane. Right. I never even heard anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Drew, do, do, do me a favor. Tell me what did you when you looked into that, tell me about what what did you find out about that? Yeah, so there is well, correct me, because yeah. you have been in this way longer than I have, which has been for just a number of hours. Yeah. But um there uh, unlike in scripture, Romans chapter five speaks abundantly clearly to the fact that Adam sinned and we all fell in Adam, and that there are two different representative heads of all of humanity. And either you are in Adam and you're condemned or you're in Christ and you have the free gift of justification and mm-hmm. life, eternal life. Um, when Adam sinned, according to scripture in Genesis 3, all everyone fell into sin with him um, and all of his descendants are now sinners. Like uh, so many theologians have said, we do not... Um, 
we're not sinners because we commit acts of sin, but we commit acts of sin. We sin because we're sinners by nature. Mm -hmm. The understanding, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, of the fall according to Sun Young Moon is that Eve had sex with Satan. Yes. And then she was she had this kind of original sin from Satan himself and then she passed that sin on from herself to Adam right. by subsequently having sex with Adam and then all original all, all, all the stain of original sin came down the line through sex because of that original unholy union of Satan with Eve and then every subsequent sexual union that took place and every other person born after them uh, has this mark of Satan as a result yeah. of that. Is that yeah. correct? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what the, and that's why they they focus so much around the the marriage ceremony and yeah. having like a pure blood lineage. Um, and if you actually go back in, in uh, Dr. Walt, Walter Martin's book, he talks about like in the early church when mm -hmm. Reverend Moon started the church, he would do these things called blood cleansing. Um, and he, I read about that. That was yeah. that made my blood boil. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. be honest. Yeah. yeah. Tell it's for anyone. Just to, can you explain to one uh, just in, just so the audience can get context too? What what, what was that? What, what was blood cleansing like during the early days of the Unification Church? Yeah, so um, because Moon was seen as someone that was sinless, um, a lot of the, the women in the early church, and he later got a lot of accusation from it from like the authorities and stuff in Korea, but um, he would have uh, sex with a lot of the um, uh, younger members, women. Um, I, don't, I think some of them were, were married or just, you know, just women in the church. And in that way, he was able to purify their blood lineage and then of course that woman would be with her husband and that way that right. their whole and yeah, then their, their family lineage. would subsequently be cleansed yeah that is disgusting that yeah. is evil um quick question moon according to his own teaching he did not have original sin correct yeah so mm -hmm. one question i had was if moon did not have original sin how did moon's own parents avoid passing original sin onto him when they had sex to conceive him wouldn't, according to his own theology, he receive the original sin from his own parents who have the mark of Satan still passing it on to him? How did he avoid that? Yeah, I don't know if Moon actually goes into that. Um, I think uh, some people, what I remember hearing is that once he received, I guess, the um, the vision from G or when Jesus came to him. That kind of um, wiped everything in the past yeah, clean. Yeah, that, that's what sense. I remember hearing growing up. But there's, that's convenient. To be honest, there's like a lot of blurred lines right. um, yeah. and a lot of stuff that's you'll hear contradictory things from different members. So, yeah, forgive me if I'm not super clear. Oh, because... no, don't worry. I mean, I actually <laughs> would be surprised if um, if the church had an answer to that question. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, Drew, one of the things, too, it means I love the fact that you're on here because like I'm you're, you're, you're no, 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 it, no, 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 it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Like you, you brought that up and, you know, but it's most of the time, you know, we would view a lot of people would just view why would someone logically get into something like this? Who's making such a claim. But most of the time when people get into a cult, you know, usually they're kind of, they kind of pr bring these things up progressively. Mm -hmm. And usually when you're totally convinced that this person is the Messiah and they have this great and transcendent experience, like thinking through what you just brought up, uh, Drew, logically, it's 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 usually not something that's going to be like people aren't going to think that way because once you kind of get to the point yeah once you're in that far yeah it's like, to you that you have to do all these other works um, messiah so like <laughs> your condition it doesn't yeah. like you must like that logical reasoning must at some way be faulty because he's just the messiah and you just have to you know believe it right right exactly mm -hmm. so I think once you get and you'd probably agree too is that once you get to a point where you're kind of brought through that step by step, uh, gradually, you get to the point where you're not thinking through that type of reasoning. Well, what about Sun Young Moon's parents? Uh, anything like that. Um, but maybe also to explain some of the processes of the what happens in, in the uh, marriage ritual, because also this will this will correlate too with what they believe about God, because he uh, Sun Young Moon was born to parents who are Confucian. 
uh, who believed in Confucius. And so they, he kind of blended in a lot of Eastern ideas, mm-hmm. uh, spiritism, and kind of blended that in with Christianity. And, and in very ways, in many ways, we talked about yesterday, uh, Hannah, it's, it's similar to our series on the Enneagram, because that's another example. You're kind of seeing a hybrid of, like with Richard Rohr and a lot of mm-hmm. Eastern ideas, uh, trying right. to blend them into Christianity. Um, but maybe it just explained to, uh, for people can understand what are, th- what takes place in the ritual for, like religiously, uh, during the marriage ceremony. Um, and how does that connect to spiritism and just tell them a little about what takes place during the ceremony so people can understand. Yeah. So, um, I, I personally have never attended one, right. Mm-hmm. Um, all my siblings have, um, but as far as I know, they're extremely long, drawn out ceremonies. Um, Sorry, what are these ceremonies? The marriage, like the mass marriage. Oh, the mass ceremonies. marriage. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the marriage ceremonies, I mean, um, some some people, they'll, they'll go and there's like matchings held beforehand before the actual marriage ceremony uh-huh. where people will be um, matched by, and you'll have like some people that are mediums. Um, I think in the early days when uh, Moon... Reverend, you know, Sun Moon, he was actually doing the, the matchings. He was, um, he was, uh, being guided by different spirits. Um, you know, finding, you know, which man would fit perfectly, which with, with, which with whatever woman. Um, but later on he stopped doing, I think some of the, the marriage ceremonies and it kind of uh, evolved in this, this, um, state where the actual parents of the children would start choosing, um, spouses for mm-hmm. their children, and nowadays, um, kids that are that are born into into the church um, will kind of just court each other, just kind of on their their own terms, and you know they'll have some counseling here and there. But in terms of the, the marriage ceremony, um, I'm not really sure what actually goes on specifically. Um, they're just taking vows, basically, to um, be married under, um, you know, the, the tr- they call them the true parents of mankind, Reverend Moon and his wife. Um, and, uh, yeah, a lot of them are, are international marriages. So some people will, will show up and they'll have these, you know, these matchings where, you know, one day they just get matched to a complete stranger from, yeah. <laughs> from Africa or from Japan. And then the next day they're married and they go off and, you know, start a family. So, hmm. yeah. That's the, yeah, so a lot of different, crazy. different cases. Oh, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're saying something about spirit, how he has sort of orchestrates spiritism uh, within yeah. the marriage ceremony. Yeah, um, I'm not sure really how that works. Um, there, there is a lot of uh, different like leaders that would I think come in and probably help and assist with the matchings and stuff because there was just you know thousands. He'd have some uh, marriage ceremonies that were up to three hundred thousand people, um, all at one time. All at one time, yeah. Um, but yeah, they used a lot of like different mediums and spiritists. I'm not sure how he actually, you know, was working with them, but um, their their view of I mean, just for for an example, his his son died in an auto- automobile accident in 1984, and he found relief by contact with the spiritist who he then hired to work in his staff. Mm. So he had spirit spiritists all around him constantly. So also if you think in terms of how he acted, of course, if he has this Messiah complex, just thinking and being there, he can be in quote unquote contact with other spirits and just say, this is what they told me. Right. But the, but the issue is, is are you really hearing things from Jesus or the Holy spirit? Or are you getting information from Muhammad? Yeah. Buddha? That sounds safe. Like, cause he didn't just claim to contact, let's say Jesus in these visions. He also said that he saw Buddha that he had conversations with him, with Muhammad, mm-hmm. with all kinds of different yep. spirits, right? So when we think about how spiritism works in forms of, of moon, it doesn't necessarily mean like a seance has to be happening during these uh, wedding ceremonies. He can just say what he wants and just attribute it to spirits. But also one thing I found interesting while doing some research, it says that every couple, after they get married, they spend the following 40 days in celibacy, and then they consummate the marriage for three days only to practice three additional years of celibacy. That is such control. I... That that's the that's the thing, yeah. right? If you yeah. think about the the original context of the fall, uh, making it focus around <sighs> sex, it's all a part of control. Then and then depriving original... you of it for yeah. so long. Yeah. Right. And and that's like you know 
First Corinthians 7. We but, see it happen yeah. all the time. Jim Jones did very similar things with people that were married. He was trying to control the relationship, control the family, which you then can yeah. mentally be there all the time mm -hmm. in their lives, even when you're not around, right? Yeah. And in fact, you know, this is one of those things too, is that, you know, uh, one of the one of my favorite authors, he's not a Christian, but uh, Steve Hassan uh, has a book, Combating Cult Mind Control. Uh, and it's just a fantastic <laughs> book. And his whole story, too, is that he got recruited and got indoctrinated into the Moonies. And yeah. he ended up being mm -hmm. uh, deprogrammed, which I, uh, Drew, you watched the movie last night, too. Yeah. It was called Ticket to Heaven, yep. which mm -hmm. I'm fully convinced it's it's loosely based on Steve Hassan's story. Um, even while it doesn't mention the Moonies, I just... It's it's ridiculously yeah. similar. Uh, they uh, they probably had to put that legal disclaimer out, but it's it, it, it actually came out the year I was born, nineteen eighty one. But it's it's just very interesting seeing the control that happens. And while I appreciate what Steve Hassan has done in his work, both freedom of mind and combating cult mind control, I believe that his bite model. Uh, outside of a biblical worldview, you can't give an ultimate accounting for the behavior control, the information control, the thought control, the emotional control. All of that stems from the theology, uh, which is really a distortion based off a distortion and, mis and misinterpretation of of the Bible and of God's word. Mm -hmm. um, but also what I want to do as a foundation as we kind of really kind of get into your story and what it was good, uh, what it was like. I mean, we're kind of sh explaining people the the f kind of just an over a basic overview mm -hmm. of some of the fundamental beliefs. Uh, and so, in the same way, how he was born to Confucian parents. Uh, I mean, he had his parents were Confucian or believed in Confucius, mm -hmm. and so he blended in a lot of Eastern ideas. Um, explain some of the theology as far as what 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 did Xiang Yang Moon believe. And teach about God mm -hmm. uh, and, G and and who Jesus was, and also the Holy Spirit, because yeah. in all those aspects, you're going to see uh, things blended into them. Because we were talking about that yesterday, right? So the biggest thing about God is that, um, and I was uh, researching up on this, is that um, Moon, uh, the way that he interpreted the Bible, a lot of I don't know if it was it was the entire Bible he interpreted this way, but he used the I Ching, which comes from Taoism. Um, and so the way that he describes God and even in, you know, their, their doctrine, the divine principle is that God, um, is of dualistic characteristics so that he's yin and yang, male and female, um, dark and light. And, um, also that, uh, God has a second nature, that creation is like the, the visible manifestation of God. Um, also known as basically panentheism. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's their view of God. And also they, they, they paint this picture. What I realized um, early on in, uh, in my walk uh, with Christ is that um, the way that uh, their, their view of God is that God, he's painting this picture that he's, he's sort of like this needy God. He's dependent on man to um, complete his mission um, and that he's, yeah, he's reliant on man. Um, that's that's the, the biggest biggest thing about what their beliefs are and who God is, um, in terms of the Holy Spirit, they, all they remember growing up and what they would say is that the Holy Spirit is the feminine aspect of God. Hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to go too much into detail about, you know, what that, what that really is. Um, their views on that. And then in terms of Jesus, they do not believe that Jesus is God. Uh, they believe he's the son of God, but not God himself. Um, and that, they don't believe in the resurrection. They believe that when he when he rose, it was just sort of like it wasn't a bodily resurrection. Yeah, it was like, like a spiritual. Spirit. Yeah, like exactly. a gnostic kind of just appearing. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Okay, yeah, and so so that's so again just understand that this is the framework in which you grew up, and this is what you're surrounded by. So again, you have a theology that's a distortion of who Jesus is, mm -hmm. and 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 also just of the Holy Trinity, um, because you have misinterpretations of God the Father, uh, Jesus the Holy Spirit. Um, you have a distorted view of salvation um, and also almost a distorted view of your parents who mm -hmm. are just biblically, they're just fallen, fallible people that ultimately are going to hurt and to fail you. But through Sun Yaman's view is that they were part of this first and pure and holy generation mm -hmm. that were cut off from the seat of Satan to uh, being part of this holy lineage via Sun right. Young Moon. Now you're the second generation. So it's all just all things that were kind of distorted um, mm -hmm. versus so in other ways, there's not because you're put on such a pedestal, right. there's no like, how do you even process just things, that, just difficulties and dysfunctions uh, in 
just growing up. I mean, every fag, every family on some level is dysfunctional, you know, Mm -hmm. but how do you even process normal dysfunctions? Like there's no point of reference to do that. Right. There isn't. And that's what obviously like that led me into like going to the new age after, Mm -hmm. you know, um, because I was just, I was so broken and so confused that um, I was genuinely seeking healing and seeking answers and seeking truth. Um, and, uh, you know, as you know, from, from just the background of a moon and his theology, um, is very tied into new age. Yeah. Um, so it kind of, it's like a pillow for your head coming yeah, out of, yeah, it was uh, interesting because it was like, I felt so suppressed as a kid. So new age kind of offered that, um, giving the appearance that it was like spiritual, you know, and kind mm. of, um, uh, going towards truth, but it gave me the freedom to do what I wanted to do. And, right. um, yeah. Yeah. But you said, so in other words, so up until, I mean, growing, being born up until age 14, mm. you, you would say you pretty much had a, would be a, a normal childhood, yeah. but in the back of your head, you just knew that something was kind of off. Um, yeah. was there, what were things that just that you observed? I mean, it's always interesting. We've had episodes where we've talked with people who kind of grew up you know, Jehovah's wit in the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society yeah. or Jehovah's Witness. And, you know, they obviously just felt out of place because they couldn't celebrate birthdays and or we couldn't celebrate Christmas or these other holidays with everyone else. So there's just ways and sometimes you felt a bit out of place. Um, with just ages zero to 14, what can you explain maybe any unique, given the whole culture that really is fundamentally, that's really the, it's, it's the, the it flows from the theology of Sun Young Moon and what was taught. But what would be just some unique things that just you experienced from your vantage point, you know, up until 14 years old, that was unique uh, that you remember? Um, yeah, just that. What were some things you remember seeing or experiencing? Yeah, I think um, and we talked about this yesterday. Yeah. Like, um, you know, I love my parents, but I I, I, I something that I, I realized or I kind of observed as a young child was um seeing my parents um, who had dedicated their entire lives to this movement. And yet they were, um, I could see that they were like really broken and, and lost and um, pushing hard, you know, to um, advance sort of uh, the unification's view of, of what the kingdom was. Um, And also just not understanding why my parents were together because they didn't know each other and all the, like the first generation when they were, uh, matched and and blessed into this movement um you know they they uh there wasn't any um there was a lack of affection that i think any kid um that seeks that um just parents that love each other and um have a healthy family um that that wasn't exploit like that wasn't um expressed in my family so something right. always felt off as a kid Mm -hmm. um and made me question um why they were why were they they were together and then the only reason they were really together was um because of their dedication to moon and and his mission um so that was was the biggest thing and then i also remember like when passion of christ came out Mm. as a kid um i was really young but i remember watching it i didn't understand everything but i remember seeing um Jesus being crucified and I was actually just filled with so much emotion and and tears. Mm. And I was like, so moon is claiming to be the second coming of, of Christ, but something just, it pricked my heart so different. I was like, this doesn't, this doesn't add up. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. To, to moon, his death on the cross was a failure yeah. because he didn't have children and create the true yeah. family. Yeah. And you're seeing the pain represented in a movie, of course, of Jesus, the yeah. creator of heaven and earth, all right. things visible and invisible portrayed yeah. on screen. And you're like, this doesn't seem like it was a failure. This yeah. seems like total accomplishment yeah. for my failures. Yeah. And what, what I find really interesting, too, thinking about growing up, how you would have grown up. I I know there's a form of ancestral veneration that goes on, but it seems like it's almost flip-flopped, right? So like your parents have you, you're the second generation. So you are born without this original sin. So you said there's times where they bowed down to you. So I can see a manifestation of the spirit that they worshiped showing itself that their faith and their hope is not in the true and living God, Jesus Christ. It's actually in their children. Yeah. Right. You're bowing to each other too. You know, kids bow to their parents, their parents bow to them. Okay. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really an an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really, really 
really odd. It's very man centered, right? For sure. But yeah, when I watched um, Passion of Christ, I mean, um, I didn't obviously understand theologically anything about right. the Bible or whatever. But um, it was I remember it being such a deep and profound moment as a kid. And um, it just was. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty a, it's, significant. <laughs> it's a weird juxtaposition with the truth about history that it all revolves around Christ, that this is the central, you know, pinpoint changing part of history the revelation of Christ, him taking that, that God took on flesh and died on the cross. Since that's true, yeah. and we all experience and live life in his creation once you watch it, regardless of how you're brought up, there's something that happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Your heart's either softened or your heart's hardened. Yeah. And it seems like the Lord was softening your heart in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. And then um and that's and also, I mean, you talked about in kind of growing up, I mean, as much as you are told how special you are and how unique you are and above everyone else, there is almost, even as a young child, you kind of felt there's sort of like this, like you, you put it down as a suffocating sense of responsibility mm. and possible expectations to kind of live, live up to. Yeah. So it's almost like in your heart of hearts, even as a young child, you kind of knew you're giving this yoke that was maybe like unattainable yeah. or just like, how do I really live up to it? But how do I... Maybe like you, was it maybe like you kind of knew deep down inside that there's no way I can live up to this, but who do I even talk to to say that? Right. Almost like there's an atmosphere in our episodes on people who in Jehovah's Witnesses where you kind of have to put this happy face all the time, but there's, everyone has their stuff that you, in their junk that you have to kind of work and talk through. Yeah. But in a, in a, a sociological environment where you're all God's special and holy lineage, like, yeah. where's there to talk about that? I mean, what what, what was that like, too? I mean, in between that age and that age frame of just what would explain that a little bit, too? Like in terms of just um, just emotionally, psychologically as a kid. Yeah. Or, um, It was I mean, just like I said, I, I just felt like constantly under pressure that I had to meet this expectation. And I think a lot of cults work that way because you're you're constantly trying to, you know, just get to the next best level. Um, and re- realizing, you know, you can, you can't do that. Um, mm. I really just trying to attain this, this peace, the state of peace. Um, but it's, it's all focused around, um, you know, workspace righteousness, right? Mm. What can I do to, um, you know, basically feel better about myself or what can I do to, you know, honor my parents more or yeah. So there was never any, any solution. I was just basically like, Chasing my tail yeah. all the time. It's hard to be yeah. Jesus when you can't be Jesus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that was a big thing too. And I think there's some similarities between Mormonism and, um, you know, Unification Church members is that you're you're kind of like put in this position of like you're like this little god, you know, um, and so you're, you know, um, that's what I was basically trying to do is just save myself, because mm. um, I was never never given that. That, that gives me a question. What what did they believe about essentially the afterlife then, right? So like, say you die, what what happens then? Yeah, that's the thing. There's no like assurance on like where you're going to go when you die. They, mm. You touched up a little bit on it. Like they believe in um like nine levels of, of the spirit world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, they, so some of their beliefs and what I've heard is that when you die, um, you go somewhere in the spirit world and um just based on whatever whatever works you do here um but kind of what um i would say um like uh grants you maybe access to a, a secure place in the heavenly kingdom is accepting you know moon as you, as the second coming as the messiah going to the holy marriage ceremony um but then your 5%s basically left to you that you have to do all these other works um and then yeah, whatever you do on earth, that kind of translates into the spirit world and whatever generations that you leave behind you, your lineage, um, their works basically account to levels that you're able to reach in the spirit world. We've got this weird blending of uh, <laughs> LDS theology lot. and Roman Catholicism with like merits. You know what I yeah, mean? I mean like, it, it's interesting. It, it seems like yeah, it's like mm-hmm. Schrodinger's cat and Russian roulette and rolling the dice all at once in terms of where you're going to end up after right. you're dead, even if you're an extremely faithful member of this church. Right. Mm-hmm. So the Moonies were also known, they, they kind of had a reputation for their sociological 
Um, they, I mean, in the seventies, it was interesting too, because Walter Mar talks about how they are kind of known as the, the cult that would brainwash people. I mean, mm-hmm. they, the big aspects again, Steve Hassan had was the pro after he has an amazing story too, which I think the movie, again, the movie, uh, ticket to heaven was based off of it, yeah. but he, um, yeah, but he got to a point where he was deprogrammed and eventually it be, that had to stop because a lot of times deprogramming involved actual kidnapping, which is against mm-hmm. the law. So it was just kind of complex, but they were kind of known for that. Um, and eventually, you know, Sun and Moon kind of really did a bunch of PR stuff to turn that around. But they were really known for just very much using the sociological aspects and undue influence and group things to get people to think and move one way. Mm-hmm. Um so I'm curious too, and on any way that you would experience that, because in in the outline you you had put down that you had spent hours of your childhood going to these quote providential speeches, uh, sitting on floors for many hours with hundreds of members, and many times the speeches were in Korean. Yeah. So you have you've had little like you'd have sometimes translators and stuff there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that was a big part of it. You know, and I think that's something to touch up on is, um, and I think how a lot of cults operate and just how I remember from my own experience growing up was you're constantly busy. So you're never given really time to really think for yourself. And um, we were talking yesterday, uh, Jeremiah and I, um, that I remember when I was going to this boarding school uh, that I would make excuses to go on like 21 day, no, no talking fast like from anybody, but it was sort of like my way of, uh, being able to like get alone time and oh, really wow. think for myself and, uh, you know, reevaluate like what this all was about, but it was constantly, you know, go, go, go. And you had, you know, this speech after another speech after, you know, it was all doing, 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 and not really, um, you know, and then also being, I remember so many times um, being accused of like being selfish for taking time uh, by myself <laughs> wow. um, to just, you know, go for a walk or eat alone and, you know, kind of separate myself from the group. So Gosh. everything had to done, had to be done in like the public eye. Why, why 21 day fast? Is there a specific reason behind that? They're really big on numbers. Um, so they have like, they call them like providential numbers. Okay. Um, I don't honestly know like the... Cause- because I was I was reading and uh, supposedly to become a member you actually have to be part of a 21 day work group. Yeah. Right. So that that's why I was like clicking in my head. I wonder why a 21 day fast. But imagine like yeah. like you said sitting on the floor listening to like Korean and all this stuff going on yeah. for 21 days straight. That's yeah. that's called programming. Not not yeah. being with anyone else for 21 days except this. Yeah, and you can't go to the bathroom. Yeah, isolated <laughs> group of people. Yeah, that is just. And you're being programmed, yeah, crazy. like straight up. Yeah, and so wow. in in combating cult mind control, going back to yeah. that, and and again, if you guys want to look, it's definitely a great book to read. And and uh, there's actually, if you look up, I mean, this episode, the, the there's an episode where uh, he is on the Joe Rogan experience. And if you look up Steve Hassan, Joe Rogan, obviously in that episode, there's some there's some colorful language that's used. So if you have sensitive ears, you need to be aware of that. But but he kind of goes a lot more into the, his whole story. And in that, he talked about when he, he initially, uh, when he was in college, he went to this retreat. Mm-hmm. Um, and in it, that happened, too, where he was not permitted to, uh, he was always alone. Uh, he was never allowed to be alone. He was always with someone. And then, you know, whenever he'd had a question, they'd always say, oh, we'll get to you. We'll, we'll get back to you on that. We'll, we'll answer that later on. More more will be revealed at another yeah. time. Almost similar to the World Mission Society Church of God. Remember how Mike, <laughs> when Michael Wiener yeah. was talking when about the, that. When the questions get too tough. Yeah, it's always, it'll be, always, it'll, 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 yeah but it's always, it it's always two peas <laughs> in a pod when it comes to that sort of thing. It's always right. this fast, rapid-fire techniques, which ultimately doesn't allow someone to think critically, but he had that happen, too, where, you know, there would also be lots of sleep deprivation. You couldn't sleep a whole yep. lot. And so it was actually within a very short amount of time he completely uh believed that you know sung moon was the messiah to really prior to that i mean he had a background just growing up jewish and he didn't really have any sort of strong religious connotations yeah. probably and, 21 days jerry yeah I bet you it 21 <laughs> probably days. it was a very short amount of time yeah they take um, your, your phones away too like when i went to school with um and that's you know just uh fyi not every unification church member who was born into the church like I was went to you know had I had more of like the intense side of it you know some kids just grew up a uh, normal family you know church every Sunday but I went to like an actual you know pretty much in this bubble of um kids that grew up with me and then you had all these church you know teachers that were not accredited um uh and they they you know they really did not um uh 
encourage like I mean they did encourage you academically, but it was mainly just they wanted you to understand their doctrine. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, taking like phones away, they did, they discouraged against from like having relations outside. Um, I mean, you would go fundraising, fundraising, fundraising was a big aspect. Um, and, uh, the, the movie Ticket to Heaven, um, they displayed that pretty well, yeah. you know, <laughs> very well. So, yeah. And even lying, you know, they wouldn't even discourage it if it, if it, uh, you know, if it benefited, if it benefits the, the organization, yeah, the organization. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wasn't it so, inter- wasn't it interesting? And again, if you if you're listening here, definitely it's on free on YouTube. Watch Ticket to Heaven. I was I found it fascinating when yeah. you talk about lying. And I don't know if you you experienced this or if you ever witnessed someone do this. But there's a point in which they are selling flowers. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe this will carry over into the second episode. Where we kind of talk about the the boarding school you went to. Yeah. Um, and that was uh, it was center. It was a unif- It was actually uh, it was a unification church school that you went to right yeah. so in the in the film there's a point where uh the main character protagonist who gets indoctrinated mm-hmm. and becomes this sort of true believer in this mysterious cult <laughs> which yeah. in many ways i would i was fully convinced i'm like yeah this is definitely there it sounds a lot like steve hassan's story they're referring to the moonies yeah but they're selling flowers and they go to a businessman they say they're part of this uh rehabilitation center um yeah but there's no rehabilitation center so mm-hmm. the guy so the main character asked the other his other uh, co laborer or person he's with. He goes, well, "Didn't you just lied to that person?" Yeah. Right. And, but he goes, "Well, in the he, I think he justified it by saying that, well, ultimately, you know, Satan is the ruler of this world, and and all of money, all the money is Satan's anyways. But somehow, by us, him giving." this money to us, he's actually contributing to the kingdom. Yeah. And he, and he basically unjustified the means. So it didn't really matter that they were telling him that this yeah. lie, like they yeah. justified it. And people would go out in wheelchairs and stuff. And like, they, That's I was talk about, yeah. yeah, they'd go out, pretend that they were like crippled. I remember one time being out in the street wow. with this guy and, um, we were fundraising for, this is, uh, was apart from the boarding school. It was another, um, uh, it was like MFT, you know, for yeah. the first generation, they would have something called yeah. the mobile fundraising team. But then for second generation, they it kind of evolved into this other program for second gen called STF, Special Task Force. Oh, wow. It's like Scientology <laughs> yeah. And, almost. Yeah, and you would go out and then you would fundraise. To be, you'd live in vans, um, you live in motels, and um, eat really, really, like, uh, nutrient deficient food. <laughs> and then you go out and you fundraise um, for hours. Um and I remember going out with this one guy, and he pretended he was blind, and so people would feel feel bad, and um, they would just you know donate and so we got. And I remember, I mean, we made we made tons of money one day just mm. going like to parking lots and WalMarts and yeah. um, like gas stations. In one day, I made like over a thousand dollars just talking wow. to people on the streets. And um, so you become, you know, really skilled with sales and yeah. stuff like that. It's, and, it's crazy. But. It's crazy. The industry, I'll tell you a funny story quickly, is that um, Carmen, who is also here at the studio and he's one of our producers, he he was um, fil- he had some sort of uh, project. It was to some sort of film school. And so he wanted to do this small uh, little clip where he wanted me to play a homeless person. So I got this old beat up <laughs> flannel shirt and I got this old beanie and... I think that in the film, he just wanted me to betray this like homeless guy. And I was going to sit in front of the Seven Eleven, and, you know, someone's going to come up and give me money or something like yeah. that. So in it, I'm just, I'm just sort of betraying. I'm like, how, all right, how do I portray, you know, a homeless person? But, um, I'm there and just like, just, and, and all of a sudden yeah. someone walks up to me that I'm expecting and is like about to hand me a $5 bill. I said, no, 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 I'm not homeless. I'm actually filming something for a special, uh, to bring awareness to, like to actually help the solve this problem of homelessness. But I just noticed just in this short amount of time, yeah. someone came up to me. I wasn't even trying to do that, but I just realized, man, there's probably so much money that probably goes back and forth with that a whole lot of time. I mean, there's obviously yeah. people that are in need that need real help. Um, Brother Wade was just here a little while, had some blessing bags. Our church is doing a homeless outreach tonight. But it doesn't change the fact that there are people who use right. what is a real reality of people that need help yeah. to, but use that and exploit that crisis, unfortunately. Yeah, and the members would get, um, that's, I mean, the real tragedy, too, is that a lot of, so a lot of the first generation that joined the Unification Church, um, and I see this just with my parents, and I, I have compassion for them because I understand they came from really broken families, and a lot of the people 
very vulnerable. And also a lot of the people that joined in America were immigrants. Um, and so they're, you know, kind of looking for a place to belong. But once you get on these, these like fundraising teams right. and you're raising like, I mean, millions, millions of dollars, um, mostly coming in from Japan, America and parts of Korea, um, you know, it's all going to basically the moon and their empire, their yep. estates. They're living these crazy lavish lives when all the members are suffering. I mean, I had kids, I had friends that just like grew up in just poverty and their, their parents would make a lot of money, but they just, they donate everything to, to the church. Wow. It's, it's, so, this is how it said. It says they often work for the mobilized fundraising teams, this first generation, 14 or more hours daily with little sleep and sparse food. And, Reverend Moon, I hate saying Reverend Moon, I hate saying Reverend, yeah. but admitted that 82 car accidents occurred in one month yeah. because these people were so sleep deprived. Like they didn't, you didn't care. It's all about the money, right? It's all about buying more businesses, about making more money and in, in increasing your wealth, essentially. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, that's how Steve Hassan got out of the Moonies is that he was sleep deprived and he drove, and this is somewhat depicted in the movie, uh, in the Ticket movie to Ticket to Heaven, and I was like, "Yep, <laughs> this is like Steven Stevenson has to be consulting after this." So, <laughs> uh, and also one of these days, we I really want to get Steve Hassan on the show at one of these points. I think that'd be a wonderful and fantastic conversation. But what in in the, his story, in Steve Hassan's story, is that he was driving late at night and he drove his van off the road because he's going on two to three hours of sleep a night, which again is another aspect of. Uh, it doesn't happen with every single cult, but within the Moonies and other cults, sleep deprivation is a huge thing. Uh, it happened both in, with the Branch Davidians. It happened with uh, Jim Jones and the People's Temple. Scientologists. Yeah, Scientology, especially when, especially when the People's Temple went down to Guyana, mm. um, things like that. But he drove off the road, and he ended up getting his leg like shattered in multiple places. Oh. The van was wrecked so bad, they had to use the jaws of life to like pull the van apart to get him there. And so because he had to go to the hospital, no ifs, ands, or buts, that's when he finally was able to, like, his brain could slow down. He could actually think for himself. <laughs> wow. And then he called the one person his sister. And the reason why he called his sister is because she's the only one who kind of played neutral and didn't actually actively speak out against Sun Young Moon because usually what will happen when you get indoctrinated, you're usually into a cult. You're given a unique identity that replaces your own identity. Uh, and so in many ways, what Steve Hassan will talk about, how you have your true self, but then you have your unique cult identity, which almost suppresses that. So many times you'll you'll interact with a cult member and it could be on the streets or it could be in real life. And, and if and some of you may have experienced with a family member where all of a sudden it's almost like something happens with them and you've seen it where all of a sudden they just start repeating the same verbatim statements, uh, whether it be a testimony, uh, whether it just sort of be their pre-programmed talking points. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, so a lot of times you'll just, you'll see, the person interchange in between their real self and their cult identity. So it's mm. a fascinating thing to fluctuate between the two. So Steve ended up calling his sister and his sister says, yeah, I promise I won't tell anyone she was lying, but she ended up getting some people who at that time who were deprogrammers. Uh, he mm. really couldn't resist them because he was confined to a hospital bed and his leg was shattered in multiple places. And it was very interesting. And this is also depicted in the film where he got to a point where they the deprogrammers told Steve Hassan where, all right, well if you just stay with us three days and mm -hmm. if you're not convinced it's you know on song not on song high that's the World Mission Society <laughs> Church of God, Sun Young Moon is the Messiah, then you can go and like you're free to go. And he's like, Okay. But during that process he began to unravel and, you know, they're asking questions. He they're asked what he was asked questions in ways to make actually make him think. Versus just just the the initial right you know robotic response and once he kind of like got in touch with his true self that he hadn't really been in touch with for years it, he said he was like sobbing uncontrollably um, so yeah it it it's just it goes to show it's a very fascinating story and and, and again I just uh, it's it's interesting too especially in relation to the Moonies because that's mm -hmm. something that you grew up in so that's kind of my tangent but yeah. Um, but yeah, did, I, I think what we'll do here is that I want to kind of go more into your story because we, we want to go into the aspects, especially growing up in the school and yeah. and kind of it's very interesting, too, because there's many aspects, too, with many times 
a cult is centered around a specific leader. Yeah. But usually once that leader passes away, some, a lot of things come up in regards yeah. to lineage because it's so focused or went around that one particular person. Um, so we'll jump into that. Given that what we covered in the first episode, is there any uh, are there any last things you want to cover uh, before we wrap up here, or you want to bring up? Um, one thing I wanted to bring up. Um, you know, one thing that that comes to mind quite often is that um, what people say about you know the. De- like the divine principle, which is their text for unification. Church. Yeah, can you hold that up just to the camera so anyone, anyone people can see? Which one? Yeah, one yeah, yeah it's, it's right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. we'll we'll post it on social media. We'll post it again. But so yeah, tell them about that book in relation. To that go ahead. Yeah, so the divine principle is sort of like this, this new revelation, sort of like you know with Jehovah's Witness and Mormon. This is like, this is the the Bible is not, uh, you know, the ultimate authority. This is sort of a, this is above the the Bible. Um, but what you see throughout the text is that, you know, they just, they cherry pick, which most quotes do, they just cherry pick from the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things they, they say is that, so Moon, he claims that this is like the new revelation, the new truth, right? And um, they refer back to the parable when Jesus is talking to uh, his disciples or to the Pharisees and he's saying, you know, I speak to you in parables, but there's a, a day coming where I'll speak to you plainly. Yeah. And so they claim that the divine principle is... Um, the, the plain speech of really what what um, you know the truth is all about. It mm-hmm. wasn't the, the Bible is not um, it consists of the truth, but it's not the truth itself. Right. Yeah. So that's a that's a big that's a big that's a big point that a lot of unificationists bring up. Um, that oh G, you know Jesus was always speaking of parables, but this is just explains everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so many ways, what they'll do is that, and this is they'll either take for they'll cherry. A lot of times, cults will do, what they'll do is that they'll cherry pick. Uh, certain Bible passages, they'll take mm-hmm. things out of context. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll take uh, aspects, passages that are a little bit uh, complex or confusing that kind of, you know, there's even scriptures that talk about how some of Paul's words were difficult to decipher or to understand. Mm-hmm. And they'll take those areas that are confusing and will kind of fill in the blank. Uh, almost right. in the same way how new it, how the New Age will take complex aspects of quantum physics or uh, neurology or... Yeah areas of science right now that are still expanding that we're just beginning to discover and they'll take, they'll fill in the blanks with that. So yeah. they'll even use a lot of times apocalyptic literature um, in like revelation or, or Matthew 24 or use ways to, you know, incite, you know, fear amongst their people saying that we're essentially the Noah's Ark. No one else can get out. So there's a lot of different variables right. in play. Um, so what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and wrap up here for the first episode. So okay. uh, thank you again for flat coming out to California. Yeah. And uh, I'm super excited to kind of jump into part two. Yeah. And I think we've got a good flow going here. So uh, we're going to take a quick uh, five minute break on RM. Uh, for you all, it means that you got to wait a week, unfortunately, but we will be back here next week for part two. So uh, thank you all here for listening in. And as always, uh, this is the brand new new year with a lot of crazy a lot of time to expect the unexpected so we are asking that you would uh, prayerfully consider partnering with us if you've enjoyed this podcast the last couple of years and allow cultish to continue so if you feel led to do that go to the cultist go to the donate tab you can donate one time or monthly and we will talk to you guys uh, next week in part two of the unification church the moonies and sun young moon with hana <laughs> Hana. Castan. Yeah. How, do, how, do you, how do you pronounce it? Hana Castaneda. Castaneda. Yeah, Nieda. <laughs> I'm going to have it down by the, by the time we're done. So, All right. Talk to you guys in part two. Talk to you guys soon.